university. But on the military front, there was a setback. At the banks of the Han River, his army came to the impregnable cities of Xiangyang and Fancheng. Beyond the great fortresses lay the Yangtze River and the heart of the Sung Empire. It took Kublai's forces more than five years to break this last bastion of Sung resistance. Then, as Kublai's troops crossed the Yangtze, more and more commanders switched to the Mongol side. In the Sung capital, Hangzhou, the royal family were frantic. The Sung emperor at the time was only four years old. Affairs were handled by his aging mother, and in 1276, the Empress Dowager finally admitted defeat. The Sung leaders were taken as privileged prisoners to Kublai's court, but the four-year-old emperor was spirited away. So Kublai sent his forces in pursuit. The last remnants of the Sung leadership put to sea and were hunted down by Kublai's navy. The last that was seen of the boy emperor was in the hands of a Sung admiral, who jumped into the sea with him, declaring, the Sung emperor chooses death rather than imprisonment. It was now 1279. 70 years of on-off warfare with the South was over, and the whole of China was in Kublai's hands. After defeating the Sung, Tartu became the capital of all of China, and would remain so right up to today. One of his first priorities was to improve communications between North and South. To do this, Kublai employed three million laborers to extend the Grand Canal to carry grain from the fertile South up to the Imperial City. Kublai could now draw on the resources of the most advanced nation on Earth. The Sung led the world in the quality of their goods, and their busy trade routes would make Kublai one of the richest men on Earth. The Mongol Empire now had the largest army in Asia, the largest fleet, the most prosperous people, and the largest city on earth, Hangzhou. It was a spectacular achievement for Kublai, and it cemented his position as Great Khan. Kublai treated the deposed Sung royal family well, and he told his forces he would not tolerate any looting of the South's riches. Kublai knew he would have to win over the people of the South if he was to lead a united China. To do this, he ensured that South China would receive the same help towards recovery from war that the North had. He introduced schemes to help with economic growth and agricultural development. Kublai Khan realized that the constant warfare which China had suffered in the decades before the establishment of his own dynasty had seriously disrupted agriculture. And of course, in a large farming-based society like China, this was a great disaster. It could cause disruption, famine, and uh, all sorts of social upheavals. Therefore, he made a very active and successful effort to try and reform the way in which agriculture was carried out in China. He also treated the Sung nobility well, letting most of them keep their land. Anyone who had surrendered was pardoned, and the different religious groups were treated well. In fact, in religious affairs, he was tolerant of different beliefs all through his reign. Buddhist, Taoist, and Muslims all had a place in his kingdom. He employed many Muslims in his court, and Muslims considered him sympathetic towards them. Uh, the same can be true of Buddhists. The Buddhists liked him, and the Buddhists considered him one of their own. And the Confucians, the Confucians had great respect for Kublai Khan. Um, Kublai Khan made a point of having Confucians in his administration. Uh, amongst his closest advisors, he had Confucians. And he encouraged the reading of Confucian classics. And whatever. So the Confucians were very happy uh, with Kublai Khan. As well. So, in many ways, he was everything to all men. This was particularly true for merchants. Kublai improved their status and introduced measures to generate trade throughout the land. As a result, 
they turned his kingdom into a global center for trade and commerce. Traditionally, merchants have had been looked down on by the uh, by the Chinese, especially the Confucians. Under Kublai, their status was was raised. Um, they were called otak, and merchants and trade was encouraged. This was a boom time for merchants, and certainly under the Mongols, their status uh, was considerably raised. As the Mongol court became increasingly business-minded, it brought the whole of Asia an incredible period of prosperity. Traders from as far afield as Venice, Germany, Indonesia and Persia all came to take advantage of a great flowering of new ideas in art and technology. Kublai himself became a patron of the arts and Chinese painting, ceramics and theater flourished. It seemed Kublai the warrior had turned himself into a civilized, cultured ruler. He recognized that for stability to follow on from his successful conquest, he would have to be seen to be ruling justly. A just legal system in the Chinese style was the bedrock of the stable situation Kublai had in the north. So he implemented the same ideas in the newly won Sung lands. This came as a great surprise to the administration there, who found Kublai a wise leader who truly loved his subjects. As a leader, um, his attitude to the poor and the peasants and agriculture was perhaps unexpected. Um, he was sympathetic to the peasants and the, the poor of his uh, empire. Um, it's often been said that the peasants suffered under Kublai Khan, that conditions were very harsh, were bad for them. Well, I think it's true to say that uh, for peasants it made very little difference who controlled them. Conditions were hard, whoever was in, uh, was in control. But under Kublai, he at least seemed to be sympathetic to their plight. Um, he made arrangements for, for them. For example, he had central stores of grain uh, set up. So when there, were, when there was drought or when there were shortages, he could avoid starvation. To encourage a sense of easy transition, Kublai made sure he ruled with a system that would be familiar to the Chinese. He organized a secretariat which was in charge of civilian issues and a privy council which dealt with military matters. Each part of the government had branches in the provinces to make sure the Khan's orders were carried out. But his implementation of so many Chinese laws and Confucian ideals of peace order and harmony, diluted the Mongol way of life to the point where his grandfather, Genghis, would no longer have recognized it. Kublai Khan is an intriguing figure because he's one of the rare figures in history who managed to, in effect, overcome his background and actually become a very different sort of person. One would expect from his warrior nomad background that in some ways he would perhaps be someone who was not terribly interested in uh, civilization, in terms of written culture, uh, or in terms of living a more sedentary and in some ways perhaps less uh, active life. But in fact, having conquered China, he gave up a great deal of the nomadic background which had shaped him and instead became in some ways a very typical Confucian-style Chinese ruler. It was an incredible example of political expediency. It made sense to Kublai to rule China as the Chinese did. But there was no doubt where the power lay. The Mongols simply inserted themselves at the top of the social ladder. Next came the Western and Central Asians, followed by the Northern Chinese, and finally, at the bottom of the ladder, the people of the South. Kublai had reinforced a way of life which promoted an agricultural and city-based civilization, and it had been a resounding success. But he was still a Mongol at heart, and he craved new conquests. Most of the kingdoms of Asia paid tribute to Kublai in order to maintain some level of self-control. They knew there was little point in opposing the massive war machine of the Mongols.
But Kublai still felt there was one thorn in his side, Japan. He had sent many requests that Japan accept him as their emperor, but every offer was met with the execution of his envoys. It was the challenge Kublai had been hoping for. He enlisted the reluctant Koreans to crew the sunk ships he had captured and mounted his first invasion of Japan in 1274. An army of 20,000 cavalry and infantry reached the offshore island of Iki and overcame the Japanese forces there. But as the day wore on, the weather began to change. And when a storm broke, the fleet was caught in its full fury and was destroyed. But Kublai wasn't to be deterred by this setback. The reports he'd received from the first attack showed that the Mongol forces were superior in every way. They had simply been the victims of bad luck. So a second invasion was launched in 1281 with a two-pronged attack from North and South China. The commanders were to meet on the island of Iki and then converge at the center of Hakata Bay. But the Japanese were better prepared than the first time and Kublai's forces met with fierce resistance. Fighting went on with little progress for two months. Then disaster. Another typhoon struck and slammed the Mongol boats against the rocks. Almost all were lost. The Mongol forces trapped on shore watched in horror as their only chance of escape sunk. The elated Japanese forces quickly overran them. But even then, Kublai didn't want to give up. Very stubbornly, after this terrible defeat, which was extremely costly in terms of men and equipment, of course, and financially, he was determined to have another go against Japan. But fortunately, on this occasion, he was just so completely put off it by the advisers and the other military people in the government that uh, it was called off. But I think that shows that maybe his judgment wasn't so good. Uh, and he sh it shows that perhaps he was rather anxious to fulfill the ideal image of a great Mongol ruler still, which is very much of the conquering hero, the conquering military chief. And of course, they were running out of neighbors to conquer. But after this second defeat and the advice he was given, Kublai decided to abandon his military campaigns and he began to get more and more involved in the decadent pleasures of court life. On feast days, 6,000 people could be fed in a single sitting at his palace in Tartu. But then, in 1281, tragedy struck. His beloved Chabi died, followed four years later by his son and heir, Chen Chin. It was more than Kublai could bear. He was grief-stricken and never recovered from his loss. And it's notable, in fact, that his rule began to decline in many ways in the last decade or so of his life after Chabi died. And he became, from reports that we have of the time, somewhat morose, inclined to drink very heavily. He ate too much and became very obese. And in some senses seemed to almost lose interest in uh, being that kind of very fulfilled, very active ruler that he had been when he had that favorite wife at his side. But by this time, he hadn't only lost his wife. The trusted advisers that he had gathered around him long ago had also died of old age. A new generation of Chinese and Muslim advisers were in court and had become corrupted by their power. But Kublai was increasingly preoccupied with pleasure, leaving the bulk of minor decisions to his court. Kublai's final years were spent in isolation. Increasingly, he consoled himself with alcohol and food, and he became fat and ill with gout. By 1294, Kublai had withdrawn from public life and lost his enthusiasm for the celebrations he once adored. The court at Tartu, once a place of merriment and excitement, became gloomy and depressed. In February, when he was in his 80th year, old age and over excess finally got the better of him. The great Kublai Khan died alone in his palace. 
Kublai's great hope had been that the lands he won would stay 